so um, so as you know, the government lab, the work that the government lab does, it offers consultancy support to governments. And the project that I'm working with right now is with Victoria. I don't know if you know her, Victoria uh -huh. Alcina. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I'm, she is, um, we're doing a research and a comparative study of innovation labs around the world. Uh, for It's a project with the Inter-American Development Bank. And what we want to do is basically get as much information as possible about the most successful innovation labs around the world in order to write a report that can inform other Latin, Amer Latin American governments who are looking to establish their own innovation lab. Okay. And so far, I've interviewed around 10 experts in, in Latin America, the UK, and we're trying to expand it more um, in Europe, Asia, but so far, the focus is Latin America. So um, you have the interview script, right? Uh, yes, or I do. So some of the questions at the end are about the Latin American landscape okay. because the study is tailored to Latin American governments. That's why. Okay, okay, okay. So I'll start with the, the laboratory specific questions. Uh -huh. And perhaps you can tell me how many employees are at the, the lab at the entity? What are their professional backgrounds? And do they undergo any training and the skills and competencies that you look for? Okay, right. So um, at the moment, uh, all the full-time people working in the public digital innovation space, or the PDIS, um, is um, uh, 21 person, including myself. Uh, and uh, you can find uh, all the uh, lists of the people, how they look like, as well as all the alums, as well as interns uh, in this um, URL that I just pasted you. Oh, perfect. Uh, right. Uh, and so... Um, Half of them were ministerial delegates, uh, mid to high level um, career public service um, delegated from ministry. We have a, um, a written rule that says at most one person can be delegated from each ministry. So that's half of PDIS. Uh, the other half of PDIS are professionals. Uh, we have like interaction designers uh, that we poached from IDEO. Uh, we have uh, actually two interaction designers um, and a um, service designer as well. Uh, so there's a, a heavy design bent. Um, there's uh, a few professional facilitators um, and there's stenographer, uh, also um, professional programmers, um, but uh, everybody kind of wear multiple hats. Uh, the programmer also is uh, filmmaker by profession and director and all things like that. Uh, and so there's a lot of cross-disciplinary uh, learning going on. And you mentioned real quickly that there's a delegate from each ministry in the government. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, at so most, each... at most. So theoretically, I can have 32 colleagues, each from every ministry, but obviously I don't. So for example, the Ministry of Defense never sent anyone, uh, but the, mm -hmm. the, the ministries who did send uh, are mostly uh, public facing. So we have delegates from, for example, the Ministry of Interior, of Culture, of the National Communication Commission, um, the Ministry of Education, you know, the, the usual suspects, as well as foreign affairs uh, who uh, work with us on public diplomacy. That's really interesting. This is the first time I hear that. And it makes sense because yeah that's really cool mm -hmm. and do they the people that are not uh, from other ministries do they undergo any other training uh -huh. to work right. right so so usually they're they're the, the trainers uh, actually but but we uh they're they're all professionals uh, but uh, for the uh, work that we do we do have training material and they get their training mostly by uh, following alone it's more like apprenticeship thing so for example a junior facilitator follows uh, a real case through uh, with a senior facilitator and they learn about facilitation along the way. Uh, so there's no uh, training. There really is just uh, on the field exercises. I see. So it's by doing, by watching others. Right. It's like it's a mentorship with the junior. Right. It is a, a mentorship model. And we do have uh, teaching guides. Uh, this one is in Mandarin, but it's very beautiful anyway. So I'm pasting you that. Uh, and there's also comic books and things like that that serves as training material uh, that are translated. So um, I'll get you the translated version. Thank you. And who would you consider as the audience of the lab? 
So uh, it's everybody, right? Everybody on Earth, literally. Uh, we we work toward uh, achieving the Sustainable Development Goal. We specialize on the goals 16 and 17, uh, but we work with the entire Global Goals Framework in mind. You specialize in 16 and 17. Yes. That is uh, private um, access. Uh, <laughs> so public so, private partnerships. So, and so 16 is, um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll specify the, the actual targets, okay? Um, so uh, for 16, uh, we work on 16.6, um, developing effective, accountable, and transparent institutions. We work on 16.7, ensuring responsive, inclusive, and representative decision-making. We work on 16.8, strengthening participation in global governance. And finally, 16.10, ensuring public access to information and protecting fundamental freedoms. And in Goal 17, uh, we work specifically uh, with 17.8, uh, strengthening the science, technology, and innovation capacity especially for developing countries. Uh, and we work uh, with 17, um, 17 uh, encouraging effective partnerships. We work with 1718, which is enhancing availability of reliable data. Uh, and then we work with um, 1719, further developing measurements of progress. Um, and arguably the existence of us, the lab, is 176 uh, knowledge sharing and cooperation uh, for open innovation, but that's not something that we work on. That's something we are. So yeah. So would you consider um, all of these targets to be the lab's main policy focus? Yes. Main policy focus. And uh, in terms of the most significant institutional and social impact of the lab thus far? Well, um, we worked on the uh, mask uh, rationing system uh, that includes a real-time map uh, with access of pharmacies built up by the civic sector, as well as the online ordering system. And altogether, uh, we made sure that uh, everybody in Taiwan can very predictably get sufficient amount of surgical mask. And we do have evidence to show that this significantly reduced the R0 of the coronavirus. We have many other uh, work that we consider successful, but this one, I, I guess, saved more lives uh, than everything else combined. That's really cool. It's an interact, you said you an interactive map for masks. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, actually built by the civil society, but we uh, ensure that the open data underneath it uh, is uh, available, as well as making sure that uh, the relationship between the civic tech community and the gov tech uh, runs smoothly. And so more than 100 applications, including voice assistants, chatbots, and you know regular maps uh, are available. And this is the site that we maintain. You can see Mastapidus, uh, which is the uh, name of our lab uh, in the URL that I pasted you. And that is basically a list of everything um, that is developed by the civil society using the open data of pharmacy stocks. Uh, and we also work with uh, other ministries on the e-mask system, which is the same, uh, except with an e <laughs> Depending to it, uh, that allows people to very easily um, collect uh, without queuing. Because in pharmacy, uh, even with the mask map, you are probably still queuing a little bit. Um, and and the e-mask is a pre-ordering system, so you don't have to queue uh, anyway. You just uh, place an order in Friday and collect starting next uh, Thursday uh, on the convenience store near you. But these two are in parallel, uh, and so you can uh, choose one of uh, the two modalities um, in any of the weeks. That's something other countries should hopefully be following. That's really cool. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, Korea actually worked with the civil society uh, friend and developed uh, exactly the same system uh, and providing their API by using the Taiwanese visualization. Uh, and Japan also worked with us in the online hackathon, uh, as well as uh, the uh, Stopping Coronavirus dashboard which started from Tokyo, but is now used in Taiwan and everywhere else. So there's a very strong connection and collaboration between the three jurisdictions. That's really cool. I've been seeing a lot of labs are doing, uh, are involving civil society to work towards containing COVID-19. It's really, that's a really great example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, in terms of innovative methods that the labs uses, 
any specific methods that's the labs to go method or so um i think um basically there is no uh fixed methods but there are ways of thinking so um design thinking obviously um and specifically um human um centered uh service design um hc sd um is um i wouldn't say a method but it's a kind of north star uh that we we hold uh and there's also another um kind of value system that says we only make Pareto improvements that is to say we reduce the risk for career public service we increase their credibility and trust and we also save their time but we never trade one of those three axes for another two so can you, can you, can you repeat that sorry it's yes so uh the, so the second uh, idea very simply put is our work uh from viewed from a career public service perspective it, it saves their time uh it reduces their risk um and then in, it improves their credibility meaning uh they're more cross trustworthy uh but we never trade one for the other two meaning that we only make pareto improvements okay thank you that helps mm -hmm. pareto improvements mm -hmm. right and and the first uh that i talk about is uh human centered uh service design or human centric there's many ways to spell that human centered design and then parito improvements mm -hmm. and um in terms of financing how does the lab obtain financing well there is um a plan called the dg plus uh plan that runs for eight years that includes the uh, necessary funds for the lab to to operate and for uh, more information uh it's in dg plus taiwan dot taiwan dot gov dot tw dig and it's uh so basically it's government funds yeah it's 100 percent of government funding 100 government funding and there's no funding from any other sectors like the the lab does not get funded by the private sector or by consultant projects well, the individual projects that we do, for example, the mass pharmacy map is actually like 95% of the R&D are from the social sector. And so, um, for example, the, the first on the map uh, uses Google map and uh, they incur a very high cost uh, just by the Google map usage in the first couple of days. And then Google um, Taiwan said, okay, we this is for public good. We will just waive your existing costs and absorb all the API use cost afterwards. So it's, I guess, a kind of in-kind donation. Um, and so that's that's cross-sectoral. So, so, so I guess, and depending on specific projects, the specific projects can be funded by other entities. Yeah, because but we, the lab we, itself... we cannot uh, waive uh, other people's Google Map usage, right? So, so the API usage uh, waiver needs to be donated by Google. Okay, um, but but the lab itself is yep, funded. Yeah, the, the staff, the staff itself is entirely government funded. And. Um... What would you consider the key organizational capabilities of a successful innovation lab? Well, I think uh, this reflects my HR policy. Um, each newcomer need to offer a new perspective. And this is partly why we do not have two delegates in any of the ministries. Because if the foreign affairs ministry, for example, send 10 people, then we become a section of the foreign service. So um, each person need to offer a new perspective. And also, they also need to uh, work with the idea of global goals. I mean, it's okay for them to work um, kind of selfishly uh, for the career improvements and things like that, but at least equal part need to be devoted uh, to the public good. And finally, they need to work in the open, work out loud. So uh, making sure that through the use of the collaboration tools that their work at any time uh, is made visible to every other ministerial delegates as well as to the civil society uh, and the people who are professionals uh, that are comprised the other parts of the PDS.
So work is visible and um, right. So so we say work out loud. That's that's the slogan. And um, so there is moving to more of innovation labs and society at large. Um, how do you engage or do you motivate citizen participation? Sorry. Right. So in Taiwan, uh, we literally occupy the parliament asking for citizen participation. Uh, and the uh, parliament, um, after being occupied for three weeks uh, in 2014, um, let everybody see that it is possible with half a million people on the street and many more online to achieve a set of consensus that is coherent and eventually adopted by the head of the parliament. So it was a successful occupy. So because of that, I would say that the legitimacy of this methodology um, is very high and the government officials who didn't support that uh, lose their mayoral uh, election um, on the uh, end of 2014. Uh, and so the, the mainstream political idea in Taiwan now, um, for example, in the previous presidential election, uh, all the major um, parties candidates, as well as their vice president candidates argued for open government. Uh, and so it is uh, kind of rare that this is uh, one of the few um, cross-partisan idea that everybody think is a good idea uh, across all the four parties in our parliament now. So it's so open government is has full support of all the different parties and yes. of, all, of the government. Yes. And the legitimacy is derived in part from the Occupy movement. Yes, because uh, it's a demonstration, but, but not in the protest sense, but a demo sense. And um, so how how so the how is the lab perceived by society? Uh -huh. So um, I think the so the question was how do we collaborate with society, or what? How how does how for example in certain countries um, when when you tell a citizen about an innovation lab or it's part of the government, there is this people perceive that um, as. Something because it's part of the government, so there's this trust. Well, we're we're Other literally a park in the in the heart of Taipei that everybody can walk in. We tore down the walls, uh, and uh, everybody can walk in during my office hour in Wednesday from 10 a.m. to the evening and have a 40 minute chat with me. Uh, and so um, we're seen as very accessible uh, and oh, wow. also um, just a place to to enjoy good food because it uh, opens until 11 p.m. every day. Um, with a kitchen and all that, uh, and people can hold really anything. Uh, we hosted, um, for example, the universal basic income folks, uh, and uh, as well as people, well, teaching the elderly, like 70 or 80 years old, how to use phones to make movies and, and digital opportunity stuff and, and everything in between. I mean, um, as long as you can say which global goal you're working toward, which target you're fulfilling, then our facility is offered for free uh, for you to use. And also we work with, um, in the second floor, there's um, like two dozen uh, teams uh, freshly um, entered uh, for a almost a year of incubation program and each one again working on a startup or a social innovation idea. And so it's also an incubator uh, in, in the same building. I'm not saying in the same office, but physically it's a very happening place. Oh, wow. Uh, so basically, everybody can can access the building and everybody knows about the labs right, or, the, or people know. Right, yeah. right. The, the, the social innovation lab uh, is, I mean, people know uh, if they watch a certain uh, <laughs> Uh, stand-up comedy show, uh, their address, uh, which is um, number 99, uh, section three, Renai Road. They may or may not have uh, visited it before, but it's uh, pretty well known. Uh, and uh, the website is also bilingual, uh, so you can check out the English part as well. Oh, perfect. That's good. And um, what role do you think government labs play in ensuring participatory policy making or in the sense holding um, public policy makers accountable for participatory policy making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it ensures that whatever people's innovation is, uh, we can listen to them 
and uh, and the distance between a new idea, like we should have a um, hot spot map for uh, mask distribution uh, from the inception of the idea to the implementation, to me noticing it, or people bringing it to me during one of the office hours, to me talking to the prime minister, the premier and the cabinet colleagues about that is in a matter of days. Um, and so previously it would have taken weeks of very growing meetings uh, across all the various levels of the government uh, for the prime minister to notice it. Uh, but um, now with the social innovation uh, uh, culture, everybody know that uh, they can just find Audrey and if it's a really good idea that saves lives, then the premier will learn about it next Monday. So in a sense, you could say that it facilitates access. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in both ways too, right? So the oh. prime minister um, can, of course, visit the actual convenience stores and pharmacies to find things out themselves. But he can also rely on tools like Polis uh, to gauge the feeling of what people feel about his new policies, such as um, opening up the mountains for free uh, access of mountaineering, uh, which is, of course, a great policy. It cuts red tapes and so on. But people also, of course, uh, have legitimate concerns about ecological preservation about indigenous culture and things like that and we can make sure that using polis we can listen at scale what is the tool that that the, that, that can be accessed to, to uh, so, see what people yeah so it's called polis uh, p-o-l dot i-s uh, and uh, um, there is a somewhat dated but still very useful um, MIT Tech Review uh, article about it. And uh, if you have more time, then there's a less outdated uh, BBC click um, film uh, and also um, write up uh, about it. And uh, I'm, I'm sending you both. Thank you. P O L I S. Yeah, PLOIs. It's a technology uh, developed in Seattle, uh, but we helped uh, developing and translating it. Yeah, it's really cool. Open source too. Yeah. And in terms of the private sector, ON, ONG, ON, NGOs, and the not for profit sector, what, mm -hmm. what role do you think they play in public sector innovation? Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, I would say that our uh, private sector, um, unicorns, quote unquote, uh, often have a, a social purpose. So one of the Taiwanese unicorns, for example, Gogoro, um, is not only a company that makes uh, like electronic scooters um, powered by electronic battery, but it's also a uh, energy use and renewable energy uh, innovator. Um, and so they have carbon emission as well as um, reducing traffic accidents and things like that in their carbon emission. So in a sense, they are um, companies with purpose, but of course still for profit. Um, and on the other side, we have social sector that are for purpose, but still with profit. So we have um, successful like consumers co-ops and um, which is the homemakers union. Um, and we have uh, the city and uh, Keras foundation and so on, which are often considered charities, but they're also with profit. So um, with the private sector being for profit, but with purpose and the social sector, which is for pro purpose, but with profit, um, the, their role in public governance uh, is very clear. It is to make sure that we work on a common purpose so that everybody can benefit. Um, and so most of our work is not um, doing one-on-one -on -one relationships uh, with specific vendors or specific um, procurements, but rather making sure that innovative partnerships um, can happen. And we even design an award to it so that um, the recipient of the award is not any particular organization, but rather uh, is awarding unlikely um, partnerships between two organizations, usually one in, public, uh, one in public sector and one in the private, or one in private and one in social, and things like that. Unlikely partnerships in the different sectors. Right, so it's called uh, Asia Pacific Social Innovation Partnership Award, and I pasted you the link. Thanks. So the quote was, the private sector is for profit, but with purpose. Uh -huh. Yes, and the social sector is for purpose, but with profit. Yeah. And um, so oh, moving on with more about innovation labs and their relationship 
with government and the public sectors. And how receptive are government officials to consider the policies designed or the projects designed by the innovation lab? Has there ever been a time where, where they weren't as receptive? Well, Taiwan has a very strong mechanism design culture. Uh, and so um, mechanism design is essentially about evidence-based policy making. Um, and you design mechanism to gather more evidence for more um, evidence-based decision-making and it repeats, right? So our contribution is to, to say, it's not just the experts and representatives hold useful input in the evidence-making. Uh, people's feelings are also important. Uh, and we, instead of using very crude tools like telephone poles, uh, which have fixed questions and really has a very bad uploading bad, uh, bit rate, uh, we make sure that uh, we use slightly better ways, such as polis um, that reflects people's um, a truer um, reflections, uh, and they can also uh, contribute statements and innovations themselves, essentially increasing the uploading uh, bit rate uh, to gather uh, evidences in designing public policy projects. And we also work on face-to-face -face meetings, uh, what we call open collaboration meetings as well. And so I, I don't think anyone in the Taiwan government needs convincing about evidence-based policy design, but participatory um, evidence-based design or participatory mechanism design does take convincing and that's what we mainly focus on. So uh, it's, it's, so the work is in the participatory evidence. That's right. Making. That's right. So, uh, because, you know, if you, everybody knows that if you do a, a telephone poll, um, the, the poster can actually influence a lot just by ordering and the wording and things like that uh, of what the eventual outcome is. And so it's not uh, necessarily seen as a very strong evidence in evidence-based policies. But if people do meet face-to-face -face and deliberate and facilitate it, uh, a common consensus that people can also spread by themselves and even commit themselves to perform part of the work, then it's a much stronger evidence that there is a popular will. So in a sense, could you say that you work to improve the evidence? Not so uh, much. Yeah, I, I improve, uh, I, I work with other sectors to improve uh, citizen input into the evidence. Citizen. And um, so many critics sometimes claim that innovation labs tend to be isolated mm -hmm. entities. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, this yeah, question- we, we simply don't have that problem because our minister yeah. delegates are anywhere from section chiefs to director generals. And uh, yeah, I think all these questions is does not really apply because, mm -hmm. yeah, but in maybe in terms of uh, how does the lab differ from the, the rest of the government institutions? So we have the same value, as I said, global goals, that's a universal value. So not only it's the same in Taiwan, it's the same everywhere in the world. Uh, that's why we use SDGs uh, as the value. Our methodology is slightly um, different because as uh, far as we know, um, no other ministries tear down their walls and <laughs> allowing people <laughs> to walk in and then just have 40 minutes of my time to chat. Um, and so in terms of access, it, it really is different, uh, but otherwise we, we do have the same values. Uh, so the walls are teared down in all the ministries, not just at the innovation lab? No, it just at the innovation lab. So oh. the, uh, you asked about the difference, that's the difference. Yeah. Right, so, so <laughs> I, my, my office is literally in a park and I tour around Taiwan to the rural indigenous and offshore islands uh, and connect back through telepresence um, to Taipei and asking the 12 ministerial uh, section chiefs or higher to listen to the local people's voices and so on. So uh, I, we, our methodology make use a lot of telepresence and co-presence um, technologies. And, and these are really new. I mean, these are evolving technologies. And so it makes sense that government institution isn't designing them in because it's just literally too new. Uh, but because of coronavirus, everybody in the world need to learn about it now. Um, but in any case, yes. we, we were pretty <laughs> avant-garde, but, but now it seems that everybody needs to learn about it anyway. Yes, this is my this is my I think third time using Zoom. So it, yeah. um, everybody's right. using it's a, it's, a, it's a necessity now, right? 
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we, we have our own meeting platform, actually. So, uh, and it's open source. So, uh, and it, uh, it's hosted in meet.p.tw. So uh, next oh. time around, we can just go there and you can type in a room number and you can start meeting. Um, and I mean, it's a free resource that we make available. So you're free to use it too. And so anyone in the, anyone in, any citizens can use it? No, or anyone even... in the world, anyone in the world. Oh, interesting. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's open source. Uh, what we do is just contributing to network infrastructure. People, people should, yeah. It's, right, and especially now, it's a really useful uh, tool to have. Yeah. And um, in terms of the biggest obstacles and biggest challenges that mm -hmm. the lab has faced, what are the, the what do you consider to be the biggest obstacles mm -hmm. um, that you face within the state or or just in general to innovate? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, anywhere that doesn't have broadband access um, is a blind spot. Right? We we can't reach them. Um, but uh, fortunately, Taiwan has broadband as a human right. Um, and so anywhere, uh, even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters, you still have 10 megabits per second for 15 euros per month, a limited 4G connection. But in the very few spots that this still doesn't um, cover, well, um, these are our main obstacles and challenges. And, and I consider it personally my fault if anywhere in Taiwan you don't have a um, 10 megabits per second connection. Um, and so that's the main challenge and we're well on the way of solving it. Our internet penetration rate, coverage rate and everything like that um, is very high um, according to multiple international sources. So uh, you said, what is considered a human right? Uh, broadband access. What, internet access? Uh, broad, broadband internet access. Oh, broad, broad, broad. Especially now, you can see that. Yeah, definitely, de definitely, yeah. So, um, yeah, for, so for example, the individual internet usage rate in Taiwan is 88.8% uh, uh, as of last year. So it means that around 11% of people still are not using internet regularly. Uh, the mobile phone availability is at 97.9%, uh, uh, meaning that there's 2% uh, of people or their area uh, doesn't have mobile access. Um, and so these are the two main obstacles, uh, both in terms of uh, familiarity of the devices as well as, as the connectivity, the last 2%, and, and that's our main obstacles. And... Um... You, uh, the lab is part of the of the government, but was it when the lab was first started? Was it hard to institutionalize uh, the the programs and the policies created by the lab? Like not not at all, because because uh, in the cabinet we have this design uh, called ministers at large. Uh, or variously horizontal ministers or minister with a portfolio. But the idea is that uh, above the 32 vertical ministers, there's nine horizontal ministers that doesn't have a fixed ministry, but can have their offices comprises of ministerial delegates and their work specifically is to tackle across ministerial issues. So there is already a um, design, a structure for it. And I just apply it for digital innovation. So, and in that sense, do you think the, your, your experience had to do a lot with, there is already political will in the government? And political structure. Oh, political will. And political. So that facilitated everything, even yes. the institutionalization. That's right. So in a sense, the bootstrapping is already done by the time I joined. Anything else that you, you think, uh, Credit it, this this uh, institutionalization, the political structure, the political will. Uh, anything else that you consider was key to having everything set up? Well, as as well as the popular will, which is evidenced by the Occupy movement, right? So you need both political will and popular will. And that was all right. The set was the the stage was set. Yes. And. Um, now moving on to the innovation landscape in Latin America, which is a little mm. bit different. Yes. Um, uh -huh. 
-hmm. This question, I don't know, uh, how much would you consider a Latin American government would have to invest to establish an innovation laboratory? I, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, that uh, more expert uh, people can uh, um, uh, answer this section of questions than I do. Because uh, although I did visit Buenos Aires and so on, I did not have an uh, in-depth interview uh, with the Korea Public Service there. Uh, and we do hold presidential hackathon and I do meet delegates from, from say Honduras um, and, and so on. But uh, again, we didn't go through this um, career public service level, uh, working level discussions. I mostly talked to political appointees or ministers and, and so on. And so all the information that I get from them uh, is not from a working level perspective. I but your, your questions are all working level questions. So, so I, I really cannot answer anything from from the Latin America <laughs> section because I do not have sufficient information. Okay, yeah, the same happened with the, when I interviewed the UK. So uh -huh. they, uh, but in terms of, uh, in general knowledge, if there was a, uh, any government in the world that was looking to establish an innovation lab, what mm -hmm. top three advice would you give? Well, um, first of all, I think uh, radical transparency really works, especially if the innovation lab is as PIDES is a combination between career public service and professionals uh, from the civil society, each side will want to hold the other side accountable. And the most easy way to do that is through radical transparency. Uh, and so people who walk in to have 40 minutes of my time really need to um, go through the visit protocol, which I just pasted to you, which mandates a open transcript policy, uh, including our own conversation, <laughs> that at the end of the conversation, we can choose to publish as video or as transcript. And so that's the first advice. The second advice is voluntary association. Um, if a innovation lab beginning uh, their work to uh, command other ministries to obey without empowering them, without explaining why, without coaching and facilitation, then the innovation lab, while it may have the presidential or the prime minister's will, uh, tend to dissipate and get relocated to an unimportant ministry uh, or agency uh, once the president or the prime minister change hands. Uh, but if you begin by saying, no, we're just accepting volunteers uh, from other ministries, then they will think that it's, um, their own idea, and they will sustain the innovation ecosystem even after the prime minister changes. Well, we've survived quite a few prime minister changes now. Um, and so uh, the third thing um, is- can you, I'm sorry, can you, can you expand on that? You called it monetary association? Voluntary association. Oh. So, so, <laughs> so radical transparency, voluntary uh, association, and Finally, location independence. Now, uh, I really don't have to explain location independence because now it's a necessity given the coronavirus that uh, the same office needs to separate into two different chunks uh, and people need to work from home uh, and in co-working spaces that are nicely ventilated. Um, but you do something that needs convincing. Nowadays, everybody do it by default. So radical transparency, voluntary association and location independence. Mm -hmm. And can I ask you about voluntary association? Yes. Um, how how can how can uh, uh, someone an, another government lab create that ex um, perspective of voluntary association mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, when it's being set up by a specific government? How, mm -hmm. how what advice would you give a government lab who is be transitioning between two different? Uh, one prime minister or one president to another mm -hmm. to promote that voluntary association? Well, just work together, right? So uh, for example, we have a principle for interview before collaboration meetings that talk in a lot of detail how the various ministries and sections need to work together, uh, like orchestrating something. Uh, and that's for the working level collaboration. For the uh, mid-level, like section chief uh, collaboration on how to choose a topic for cross-ministerial partnership, we have the principle for the topic selection, which I also just pasted to you. Above that, there is a um, direction uh, for implementing the role of participation officers, and that is a uh, like institutionalized 
uh, directive, uh, and that provides for the ministers the what what they require um, to actually enact this uh, within their own uh, ministry, and all of this is a legalese, right? It's it's very con uh, verbose text. So fi finally, we have a like a quick drawing, uh, golf lab style, uh, like one one pager <laughs> <laughs> that explains the role of POs and then that's the last link. Uh, but it mostly just summarizes the three uh, institutionalized uh, legalese. Perfect, thank you. And now the, the last five questions, um, mm -hmm. you just have to say if you strongly agree or you strongly disagree. Okay, the with first one, the I, strongly, I strongly don't know. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. I know nothing oh, yeah. about the LSC context. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, the second one, public sector labs can ultimately change the culture in the public sector government. Uh, uh, strongly agree. Strongly agree. And public sector innovation labs are effective at developing new policies. Strongly agree. And specifically for policies that the government knows nothing about. No like truly exploratory policies. No, it's nothing though. And uh, funding is the biggest obstacle to innovation. No, I, I, I think it's access uh, from broadband access to political access to um, cross-sectoral uh, trust as a mean of access. Uh, these are the um, biggest obstacle funding flows in kind of automatically if you solve the access and trust issue. Interesting. Uh, so access, political, including political, broadband, and trust. And if you have all those, you will have mm -hmm. funding. Yeah, you'll have funding because essentially all your R&D costs will be absorbed by your partnering organizations. So you can run on a zero budget. And once you can run on a zero budget, there is no funding problem. True. And innovation labs are most successful when they're embedded within a government agency. I would say it's successful if they're embedded within multiple government agencies, the more, the better. In multiple. That's an interesting point that no one has brought up so far mm -hmm. because you, because you want them to be, you want it to be all over governments. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And normally, yeah, it's interesting because when I did this, I strongly agree to strongly disagree at the beginning, I guess, depending on, on the content, context or where each lab is based, sometimes funding was the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, other labs already have funding, but it, it's strongly attached to the political will of where, where they're located. So that's very interesting to note. Mm -hmm. All right, that's it. So yes, are you, you comfortable so with me just publishing the, the video or should I embargo it after you finish your research or do we just work on a transcript? Um, I'm comfortable with the video. Let me okay. just confirm with Victoria. Okay, okay, okay. She, she's my supervisor. Okay. I will ask her. I'll, I will... I'll, I'll post it as an unlisted video on YouTube so that people won't see it, but I'll send a link to you uh, and you can see how it looks like and then uh, you can tell me what to do. Okay, I'll, I'll ask Victoria and I'll get back to you. Thank you so much. Do you have any other questions for me? No, not at all. Uh, and stay safe and have a good local time.